All right, all right. Bridgepoint Church, how are we doing this morning? You guys feeling good? There we go. Whether you are downtown in Seminole, here in the room in Tyrone or online, I am so glad that you are here today. I think it has the potential to be incredibly impactful. We're going to be taking communion together in just a few moments. And for all those reasons and so much more, I'm excited about what I think God might be up to today. We're in a series. This is week three of a series called Empty. It's sort of a journey towards a tomb. And I don't want to spoil next week for you but you're going to want to be here, all right? If you don't know that story, then make sure you're here next week. Grab a friend, make an invite, bring somebody, drag them kicking and screaming if necessary. Just tell them my pastor told me to, all right? They'll appreciate it in the end, okay? Uh, Today, I think, is going to be really, really neat. Today is historically uh, the day that in Christian tradition we call Palm Sunday. Historically speaking, this was a day 2,000 years ago where Jesus was entering Jerusalem for what would be one of the very last times. And he was entering Jerusalem to much fanfare. In fact, you would have thought, had we been a fly on the wall or a participant in the scene, scene, they call it Palm Sunday because they were laying down palm branches for the king, the Messiah, to enter Jerusalem, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He, He comes to save, like, The people, it seemed like they were really getting it. And so 2,000 years ago, that's what took place on this day. And it's a stark reminder of how fickle the human heart is. It's a stark reminder of how quickly you and I, by our nature, can get really caught up in emotion. Because in just a matter of days, 2,000, just a little over 2,000 years ago, the scene, the setting, the experience the, uh, the, the encounter, the words toward Jesus would change from, he's the Messiah, he's the Messiah, he's our king. It would change from, he's the Messiah, to crucify him. Crucify him. In other words, kill him. Give him the criminal's death. He's not it. He's a fraud. He's not worthy. It's not the one. Move on from him. Release to us the criminal. But just kill Jesus. I loved Cam's message last week, taking us to a really intimate scene in the garden and reminding us that it is a very biblical thing to understand that some seasons in our Christian life are preparation seasons. They feel waiting. And for us, it feels like we have waited far too long. But in the grand scheme of things, God is simply executing the plan of the one who holds the whole world in his hand. That was the reminder of last week. Don't sleep on what God's doing in your life. Don't sleep on it now and don't sleep on it ever. Because right after that moment, Jesus was praying in the garden. If you heard last week's message, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And if not, man, get on the Bridgepoint app or our YouTube channel. Connect with those messages. Uh, we don't do them because we, we we think they'd just be something fun to do. We do them because we want them to stir something in us about the Almighty. And, and here was a scene last week of Jesus praying in the garden with his disciples. They were falling asleep and they, he finally said, you know what? Stand up because I can see what's coming. And what was coming was the people that were looking for Jesus to arrest him. That days before they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, hail him. This is it. Lay those palm branches down, guys. This is what we've been longing for. It's the king. He's coming into Jerusalem. And a few days later, one of his very own, his name was Judas. Judas walked up and had the audacity to give his rabbi, his teacher, a kiss on the cheek. And that was the sign. This is the one to be arrested. You see, the political elite, the establishment, the Pharisees, what we often refer to them, but the Jews that were in power, they were totally triggered by Jesus. The scene they had witnessed on Palm Sunday was not good because all that meant to them is we're losing our power. We're losing our authority. We're losing our control. And the the fickleness of the human heart was just boiling over. From them, it was like, we must do something about it. For the people, it was like, this is what we've been longing for. And if you blend that up into what we now refer to as Holy Week, Easter Week of 2,000 years ago, it was a scene that, that has developed into one of the greatest atrocities of all of humanity. They arrested Jesus after his hours of prayer. 
And they took him in. You can read this in the Gospels. They took him into what was an absolute joke of a trial. They, they, in fact, they, no one wanted to actually deal with him. So the ruling authorities, the Jews couldn't put him to death like they wanted to. They didn't have the authority to do that. So they had to rely on Rome. So they were buttering up Rome saying, this guy's trying to uh, excite a riot. It's like, I know Caesar wouldn't want that. Do something about him. And they're like, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. So they passed him to a different Roman ruler who passed him back and it finally reached a place and the joke of this whole mock trial, I mean, it's just, just embarrassing that they even allowed it to occur. That it finally reached a place where one ruler was like, listen, wh what has this guy done? And they were like, he calls himself a king. What more do you need? And this guy's like, look at him. He's in chains. What kind of king is this? And finally, Pilate says, all right, well, here, I'll make you a deal. Either, either we'll crucify this guy or we can crucify this known criminal, this thief, this resurrection. I mean, this, uh, this guy that was stirring up trouble all around town. What, what do you want me to do here? Thinking, well, this is a no-brainer. And the same people that this very historical day 2,000 years ago were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, suddenly changed their tune to Jesus where they shouted, crucify him crucify him. Pilate washed his hands and basically was like, this isn't on me. This is on you. But to keep the peace, fine. And they allow him to go through one of the most difficult scenes in all of human history. The guy that had literally just spent the past three years loving people in such a refreshingly different and real way. The guy that didn't come to start a new religion, but help people feel seen and known by God. The guy that had the power of, his, of the wind at his fingertips that could heal the ailing human body. The guy that could speak into some of our hearts, mine and yours, deepest hurts and wounds was the same guy that we're now saying, give him a criminal's death. Give him everything because he deserves it. I mean, it was a joke. And that's the scene that I want us to peek into. This day, this Sunday, represents the day they laid palm branches. Palm Sunday. The scene we're peeking into today would have been just a handful of days later in the midst of Holy Week. Matthew chapter 27. And you should just get a peek of what, what was going on for the followers of Jesus. They were terrified. Many of them had scattered. They betrayed him. For the crowd that was, that was roused up in anger against this guy that just days before, they were hailing as king. And somehow, this new way of this new king for this new kingdom, everything was unraveling. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 27, it says this. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Why the robe? Because he was a king. So let's treat him like a king. It's old joke of a trial. It says in twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. Why? He was a king. Those thorns, by the way, it wouldn't have just been that they placed it on him. They would have crammed that thing down so that it pierced into his skin. Because he was the king, king of the Jews. Let's treat him that way. They put this joke of a robe on him. They put this ridiculously brutal crown on him. They stick a, a reed in his hand. And then just to double down on it, you see these soldiers that are kneeling before him mocking him, saying, hail, king of the Jews. These four days ago, they were sailing, saying the same thing from an entirely different place. I mean, just a joke, just a joke. What did he do to deserve this? He was sinless, perfect. God in human flesh, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, everything he had taught, demonstrated, done. And here's this moment, hail, King of the Jews, they were right with their words and so wrong in their hearts. They spit on him. They took the reed and they struck him on the head. 
And when they had mocked him, they then stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Crucifixion, by the way, that's what you reserved for the most heinous criminals. You didn't just hang anybody on a cross. You hung people on a cross to make a public spectacle that if you act that way, if you've behaved this way, this is the end result. You don't do those things back in this time. And here was the king of the Jews. They nailed him onto a cross, made him carry it all the way up the hill. They drove nails right into his own body so that his body would be attached to that wood. It says a few verses down. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. 2,000 years ago. This is a historical event, all right? This is not a fiction story. These are eyewitness accounts of what took place for the king. That was real. I mean, all of history confirms that this is what took place to the king, our king. Those of you that are followers and believers of Jesus, this was the king. But man, everybody in this moment just asked themselves, what happened? Well, how did did we get here? They're, They're using the very title that he came and loved so differently with to just mock him, to make a spectacle of him, to leave him hanging there. The eyewitness account continues that then the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, derided him wagging their heads. I mean, this just heaping so much shame on him. It's the shame you're supposed to experience when you're hanging on the cross because the whole community wants you to know that your behavior and your actions are inappropriate. It's not right. It's not okay. But Jesus, Jesus just days ago had the whole city laying down palm branches and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, the Messiah. Blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord. And now they're shaking his heads, shaking their heads, looking up at Jesus and and remembering the stories, remembering what they had just participated in. Shame on him. Shame on him. They said, you, Jesus, these are Jesus's words, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders, they mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of all Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and then we will believe him. Why? Because he trusts in God. He could sing our songs. He trusts in God. So let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Hail, king of the Jews. Hail the king with his robe and his crown and his title. He lived his life demonstrating power over all of nature and all of humankind and all of our bodies and all of our minds, all over all the earth. And now in his moment of need, (laughs) he suddenly doesn't have any power. Suddenly just humiliated. Suddenly can't do anything. Suddenly stuck, physically stuck, nailed to a cross. Oh, hail the king now. If God's, if it's all about God, where's God now? The disciples, his friends, his family had to just be evaluating all this. That that, that Joe, Jesus, had said this is what was going to be necessary to rescue all mankind. There had to be something about looking up to him, suffering, humiliated on the cross, thinking, what happened? What about what he said? What about him being king? This doesn't happen to kings. And we've given our lives to this. 
Like we've followed him everywhere throughout this region. We've changed how we've lived. We've changed how we've seen people. We've changed our careers. For the guy hanging there. For the king. Watching all of this. And then Matthew chapter 27 verse 50. And it says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. And he yielded up his spirit. Other other eyewitnesses said he cried out one last time saying, it is finished. And he took his last breath. The king of the Jews, dead on a criminal's cross. How on earth did it happen? How did we get here? How could things have gone so wrong? Couldn't God do something? Why didn't God step in? Where was his father now? Where was the one that had power over all of nature? Where was the one that loved so deeply? And if he's so loving, why did he just watch him die? The followers that were so big and brave in some of these moments, they scattered. This wasn't supposed to happen like this. This wasn't their king. Something, something's wrong. And here was the one that on this day, a couple thousand plus years ago, everybody was saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. That historically speaking, in just a few more days, took his last breath, humiliated, nearly naked, dripping blood and human guts, hanging there between two criminals. For all of Jerusalem to see a fraud, phony, fake. And everybody that believed in him, embarrassed. The reality is that I don't want to move past this moment. Because if we're honest... There's going to come moments in your life and mine where in this broken world, our emotions will swing between two polar opposites. The perspective and idea that we have for our lives and where it should go and how it's going to turn out and how God's going to come through it for us to protect us or guide us or give us wisdom. There's going to come moments in this broken world where it's not going to turn out the way we thought it would. What do you do then? What do you do in the moments when life begins to feel incredibly hopeless or incredibly dark or when you feel incredibly weak or incredibly filled with doubts and questions and, and just confusion because it wasn't supposed to be like this? Because for some of your stories, I've been, I've been following Jesus for decades. I've been going to church so regularly. I'm trying to be all in. It's not supposed to be like this. What do you do in those moments? What do you do when life just doesn't go like you expected it to go? What do you do when you look back on a moment like this and in modern times are filled with just exactly the same questions that friends and followers and family of Jesus would have been filled with back then? Is this real? Did this mean anything? Now listen, I'm about to take a super hard right in this message because there's not a good transition from a moment like this, but you're probably already aware of that. <laughs> I want to I leave the tension of this moment to be something that I, I hope kind of stirs and sits in our hearts. Because quite honestly, many of you already know the rest of the story. If you don't, you're going to love next week. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that you'll spend time processing this truth that the sinless savior of the world died a sinner's death. It seemed so weak. It seemed so powerless. It seemed so out of control. I hope you'll think about a specific name or a face or a friend or a family member that you say, I'd really love for you to come celebrate Easter with me at my church next week. Or I hope you'll make some time to join us at our Good Friday service uh, this coming Friday as part of our church's celebration. 
But put yourself in the shoes of the folks that were present right then and there. This was bad. This was really, really bad. But here's where I'm going to turn a hard right in this message. And here's where I'm going to ask you to track with me. Because I'm not going to resolve this tension until next week. So it's so important for you to come back. If it's your first time, I don't normally trick you and say you got to come back next week. But you do this time. But as we look back on a historically recorded event that took place just a little over 2,000 years ago, I want to begin to build upon a truth that I hope also resonates with you this week as you also reflect on the reality that Jesus died a gruesome, humiliating, weak-appearing death that he did not deserve. And here's why I want us thinking about that. Because the perceived weakness of the cross is our strength. The perceived weakness, the humiliation that we read about, the, the, the atrocity of those trials, of, of, that, of that death, of that king, labeled a king in a robe with a crown, the perceived weakness that took place 2,000 years ago on the cross, for, from our perspective, it seemed like the weakest moment in human history. But what I want you to begin to grab a hold of is though there will be moments in your life and mine that feel so powerless and so weak and so dark and so out of control, if this happened and it did, research it yourself. If it's true that the sinless savior died, then that perceived weakness becomes a forever and eternal source of strength for all who are willing to lay down our life's fights in surrender to the power of a true king. Some of you aren't convinced and I understand it because at least for me, there's the temptation to say, okay, I know this is the story of church, but how does somebody's death a couple thousand years ago, even if it was unjust and undeserved, how does that impact me today? Like in my life, right before I head back to school or to my job to engage with my friends and my family and my people to navigate my struggles and my frustrations and my darknesses and my hopeless moments. How does that death affect me today? And what I want you to see is as awful, as weak, as powerless, as off script as that death seemed, there was something else going on that the rest of the world could not fully understand. But we get the privilege of living on this side of the cross. There's an American pastor that begins to frame up the atrocity, the perceived weakness of the cross in a brand new way. His name's Jared C. Wilson. And he said this, there's some beautiful ironies of the cross that as they mock him, they, are, they submit to prophecy. In other words, it was going according to plan. As they lift him up to kill him, they're actually exalting him throughout all time. And as they killed him, he conquers. Because what man felt was either out of control or was a part of their plan to regain their own control was a temporary moment in time that God never lost his control. And when we look back to a moment of perceived weakness, if it's true and I've experienced it in a way that gives me the utmost confidence that my faith is real and distinct from every other world belief, every other world religion and every other world ideology, that that weakness now has the power to be my strength because my God is still in control today, just like he was 2000 years ago. But listen, you're clapping now. The tension exists in this way that even back then, there were people that were saying, but what? Because Paul was an early leader in the church and he wrote about it. He, he was helping process it. That in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul was addressing the cultural norm that existed then. And I wonder if any of us know folks that would believe the same. That the message of the cross is foolish. 
The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. That even today, there's a temptation to look back in that and say, man, I don't know why you, you Christians, I don't know why you followers believe in that fairy tale. I don't know why you hang on to that. I don't know why a criminal's cross is a source of strength and weakness to you. But that seems like a crutch more than it does unlimited power access. And it's simply because, this is the way Billy Graham put it, we see ourselves as self-sufficient, self-important, and self Uh, self-sustaining, don't we? I mean, I, in so many ways as a pastor, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, it is cute how much we think we're in control of our lives. But what happens when the person comes and says that they want a divorce? What happens when the job is just lost, when the market crashes? What happens when the kids walk away, when the tragedy occurs, when the bank account hits zero? What happens when you can't wrap your your mind around the test and move forward? What happens when the friend group turns their back on you? What happens in those moments to all the ways that we're in control? You see, we see ourselves as self-sufficient, self-important, self-sustaining. Billy Graham said, God sees us as dependent, self-centered, and self-deceived. That we love the idea that we're in control of our lives, but really the only thing we get to choose uh, to control in our lives is what we surrender ourselves to. Because you and I can keep fighting, but how well has that turned out so far? We can keep working harder, We can say, I'm I'm not going back to the bottle this time. I'm not going to go back to that relationship. I'm not going to put myself in that situation anymore. I'm not going to act that way. I'm I'm, going to do better. And then the next time we mess up, we'll say the exact same thing. And the next time, and the next time, and the next time, because it's cute how powerless we actually are, and yet how powerful we tend to find ourselves. Paul said the message of the cross is foolish for those who are headed to destruction because the cross is meaningless to anyone who feels like you don't need help in life. But for those of you that have recognized how not in control of life we really are, there is so much power in surrender. Because in all the ways that we try to fill our arms and fill our lives with our trophies, with our successes, with our stories, with our strengths, with our second home or the new boat or the nice car, or to pride ourselves on the relationship or the status or the clout we have on social media, we fill our arms with all of this stuff and it's a temptation to us to bring that to God in our faith and say, God, look how full I am. As if any of that can undo the brokenness that exists deep inside. In fact, Paul put it this way in a recognition of of how powerless he really is. Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul wrote about it this way, hearing from God. Paul said, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul didn't say his power is made perfect in my ability to get it right. Paul didn't say his power is made perfect in how much scripture I've got memorized and how regularly I go and give to church. It's not in our ability to hold it together, to be strong enough, to have the right words, to make the grade, to make the cut, to get the promotion, to have everything put together. Paul actually said God's power is perfected when we can recognize our weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That if you want to experience a source of divine power, it's going to take emptying yourself of all of your trophies, of all of the things you pride yourself with and all of the ways you and I tend to believe that we're in control of our own lives. Paul said, for the sake of Christ then, I'm content with weaknesses, with insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
Paul is not saying that you and I need to take a mindset where we get so giddy at how imperfect we are. He's not saying we need to live a self-deprecating life. He's not saying that we, we take on a woe is me approach so that God through me can be all that we need. Paul is simply saying, if we're going to be the ones that's going to work to save ourselves, we'll have no need to look back at the cross. But the moment we're willing to say, this isn't doing it for me. Pretending that the kids are okay when they're not. Pretending that the relationship is going to make it when underneath it's, it's ugly. Walking around smiling all the time, even though we're hurting inside or it feels hopeless or lonely or broken, that we carry all those things and we'll even carry them into church and say, I'm here, I'm going to sing along. Look at my trophies because I'm doing great. Paul said the moment that we can approach life saying, God, I can't do this, is the moment we begin to tap into a power that is not our own. The irony of life that the enemy whispers to our ears so often is that we are usually most empty when our hands are most full, figuratively speaking. I'm good. Yeah, me and the family, we're good. I can do this. I'll do better. I'll get it right next time. I'll memorize it. I got it. I'm okay. I can do this. I'm strong enough. I'm tough enough. I don't need help. The great irony of life is that when we're so full of ourselves, that's usually when we are so empty. However, the fullness we tend to search for deep inside is found when we're willing to empty ourselves before a holy and loving God. Why? Because a couple thousand years ago, God emptied himself to love and offer grace and mercy to a mankind that was really full of themselves. And if we're willing to empty ourselves of our pride and surrender all of our trophies, that's then where the power of God that took place on that cross begins to work in and through us in a way that this world cannot offer. Guys, I believe what you're searching for deep inside is not motivation to do better. It's not a stronger will. It's not doubling down on commitment. It's not faking it until you make it. It's not pretending things are okay when they're not. I believe what you and I are ultimately longing for is the power that comes from surrender. And what we choose to surrender ourselves to is really the only thing we can control in life. And God made a once for all definitive statement of his love and care for you when he allowed the king of the Jews to die in what should have been the place of my full arms of accomplishment and pride. There's so much more to this story that I can't wait to share with you tomorrow. I mean, next Sunday. <laughs> I'm that excited. But can I ask for just a few moments at all of our campuses, including online, let's enter into a time of communion where when you grab a hold of that bread and you hold that cup, you also evaluate, is there anything else that I'm carrying that it's time to lay down so that the body and blood of Jesus becomes enough? Is there anything that it's time to empty me of to experience his fullness? And may the move of the spirit across our church and church family be something that stirs a peace, love, and joy deep inside in the way that nothing in this world ever could. Would you pray with me? God, it is hard to look back on the historical realities of 2,000 years ago, to think about how Jesus was treated, the physical pain, the emotional pain, 
the heartache. And yet to remind ourselves that he endured it so that our lives that we want to feel like are so full can be emptied and then find what we're searching for. God, may today be a day that we quit playing games with you. We stop pretending. God, will we lay down our trophies, our pride, our stuff? God, thank you that we can lay it down before a God who is so loving, merciful, kind, and gracious to endure what you did in my place, our place. God, may we discover that when we're willing to empty ourselves, <laughs> that we discover a fullness from you that satisfies like no other. Spirit, would you meet us here in the power and might of the name above every other name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the sacrifice for our sin, the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said,